It's Lana. You are listening to Indie 88. Tonight, Inhaler will be playing at the Danforth Music Hall. I believe it's your second time here in Toronto. Yes. Welcome back. No. Third time. Third time. Third, time. Third because we were here in 2019 supporting a band called Blossoms oh. in Manchester. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like a headline show. Mm. So. Well, yeah. well welcome back. Headline. I think we were in Toronto for maybe three hours. Yeah. A lot of, uh, I would say a lot of North American bands have this kind of beautiful idea of going to Europe or going to the UK and touring around. Is it the same for you to come from, from Dublin and be in a van or like when you were your early days coming to, you know, North America? 100%. I mean, a few of us have been to America before, but I think driving around America together as a band, as something that you created yourselves, I think it's like rediscovering it all together mm-hmm. all again. Um that's like the idea you have in your head when you're like a teenager is like being in the back of a van with the guitars, like traveling across the desert or whatever. You've got some mad pictures in your head. And we've done that. So, mm-hmm. yeah. It's not as romantic as it sounds, is it? <laughs> I think it, I think it's it is. Very romantic. Can be in a can be. <laughs> yeah. I think it depends on your perspective. How you feeling in the morning, I think. Yeah. Uh, I did want to talk about uh, the new record, of course, um, before we talk a bit more of, about the tour. Your first album you wrote at a distance. Mm-hmm. And again, it was like, you know, like the craziest time in history. You finally get the chance to to change what you want to do differently for Cuts and Bruises. What did you go into the album? What kind of expectations did you have as far as what you wanted to, to bring out and actually record? We just wanted to write better songs, um, make a better sounding record. And I think we did that. Um, there was a few rules that we set out. Like we wanted less like information and everything. And we wanted to spend less time on things. Well, we didn't want to. We had to. So we rolled with that, and I think we did make a better record. Um, but we just kind of, I don't know, we were saying more like we did when we were like 18, 19, just playing in like our rehearsal room together before the nunnery, before like anything. Mm-hmm. Um, feels like us. Dublin in Ecstasy, is that not an old track that you used to play? It yeah. is, yeah. Is, is that the like only old one that kind of made it on the new record? Yeah, and lo- it's loads of people's favorite song off the record, so it's mm-hmm. like... It's all downhill from here, I guess. <laughs> um, that was really old, wasn't it? Like 2018, I think we we wrote it first and then kind of went away from it. Didn't we don't really know why we went away from it. We just fell out of love with it. Um, but then d- over the years, uh, people just kept asking, like, where did it go? What happened to it? We all loved it. Damn you guys. And so we, we did a version of it in the studio that we weren't, that wasn't representative of what was live. Mm-hmm. And for the first album. For the first album, and it just wasn't right. And so I think we then just put it on the shelf for a bit. And then we did see all the stuff about the fans loving it. And we went, oh. And then I think, I don't know who found the video. There's a video of us playing it in like Camden Assembly in London. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we pretty much just did that, rejigged the lyrics a bit, changed a few of the parts. and But like, ultimately, it is what we used to do um, back when we were like 18. So it's mad. Yeah. I wanted to ask a little bit about your earlier days because, of course, you know, you're, you're young folks. You're in your early 20s. But when I looked online, you've been together for over 10 years. Yeah. So you've been, you know, Can in I this keep... band for a, a significant amount of your life. There many long, many left at this stage. Yeah. <laughs> people always say, like, the first, I don't know, you get 10 years into a band, it seems yeah. like all oh, that most people would be like, oh, they must it's be really done. But yeah. we, we just feels like we've both been here for so long but also just started. Yeah. I think we were playing music together where... It wasn't really like it was just us let's get in together in like a in a shed and like play music for twenty minutes and then eat pizza, you know. And like, mm-hmm. I wouldn't even call it music. <laughs> but I heard and Josh was, was Well yeah, well that's Josh joined and then I think we became something that could actually be presentable to an audience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what a Josh, way of putting yeah. that. Josh was in a different school and I think um having someone who wasn't in the same school as us made it kind of more official as well. It just felt like we had to organize seeing each other properly. We, we had to like commit. We couldn't just be like, oh, today we just won't do rehearsals. We'll stay, I don't know, in school and kick a football around. Whereas, like, I think so things just kind of got serious once Josh joined. And also Josh was way better than we were and kind of brought um, some professionalism to the whole thing. Josh, you're, you're kind of quiet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's it he like lets, to have... He lets us speak for him because... Then. Yeah, I, I've got the best job in the world because I'm in a band with three of the chattiest guys going. <laughs> <laughs> Chill. <laughs> so, uh, but it is interesting because uh, not not every band will show up with the entire band for an interview, which I you know I appreciate you all coming after a show in another city for sure. Um, do you guys approach songwriting in the same democratic way? 
that you're doing this interview? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely the yeah. music aspect of it. We, mm -hmm. we like to all get in and, you know, as much as we can um, contribute to each person's part and help other people with other parts and stuff. But when it comes to lyrics, it's mainly Ryan and Eli that, you know, mm -hmm. that, uh, take the bulk. Yeah. Okay. It's mainly Eli. I just go, don't do that. <laughs> You're the editor? Yeah, yeah sure. that's, a, yeah, that's yeah, a great yeah, yeah. That, The editor is, is a... He's the confidant. Yeah. Okay, just, yeah. We just smile and wave, and then the occasional word will go, what about this? Yeah, we're like the grammar, the grammar nerds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We are, yeah. We're the boring guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't, you don't seem quite boring, but it does seem like this album had a, a bit of drama with, I mean, alluded to in the title, Cuts and Bruises. Mm. Can you give us uh, kind of some scoop as to, you know, what what that represents of the process? I think it was me. It's just really hard, like going through the pandemic and then getting straight back on tour. And I think there was like a rift. It, the distance, we, like we spent every day together before that, like for 10 years, as we were saying. And like um, then to have that distance, all of a sudden it was like we all of us were on different pages. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I mean, we're all friends first and foremost, but when it becomes like a, something that you have to work every day at and it's not just like a hobby anymore, it's like, it's, you know, you're paying like roadies, you're pay, you've got a manager. It's like, I think that does put a lot of strain and it kind of changes your perspective of what it is you're in. And I think the record was just something that we all needed to hear because it's just about love and friendship really and not, it's not about girlfriends. I've seen so many people being like, just keeps writing about girlfriends and stuff, you know. I know. It's about the lads. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, I don't know. I think I think that was the only thing we could write about because um, it was the only thing we were around, you know. Rob's having a chuckle. Oh, yeah, I just thought that was funny. <laughs> not, not Eli's part. That was beautiful. Yeah. But uh, Ryan's part was funny about it, being about the boys. <laughs> the boyfriends Rob's laughing at. <laughs> no, no, just us. Well, yeah, I appreciate uh, you guys taking the time. I did want to talk about the, the love that, it, that is, you know, on a variety of tracks, but love will get you there. Um, mm. Is but first off, I want to ask um, you, Ryan, because there's a kind of like a Motowny drum beat. Were there any influences on? Or is that just me putting my own? No, 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 no. That's um, uh, you yeah, hit the nail on the head there. Um, I actually, to be honest, you might be asking the wrong person because I kind of forget how it came about. I think Eli had the demo with the drum beat mm -hmm. um, in the very beginning, and we kind of like went around on this idea that was pretty much just what the verse and the pre-chorus in the song is, but the chorus wasn't there for, like, a good... And the bridge. And the bridge, <laughs> excuse me. And the, uh, for like it wasn't there for, like, a good year until we actually, like, got into the studio and actually started playing together. And then how we wrote a lot of these songs was actually just taking a lot of some of the demo ideas that were in fruition, and we actually, like, brought them to life there. And from that just being in a band and playing in a room together, we were able to come up with all these, it sounds really weird to say, it was like we actually felt like we were a band again mm -hmm. because we were actually playing together yeah. properly, which we hadn't done in so long. And then Love Will Get You There, the, the words that be just fell onto your lap there in the moment, just singing yeah. random no, stuff. We were, the, we were on the couch in the, in the gaff, the acoustic guitar. Mm. We had a little weird setup as well. We had like our studio setup, and then we had an acoustic setup where we had like, like literally a bass plugged into a JBL mm -hmm. portable speaker. I mean, it's one of those big ones, but um, I'm sure the neighbors weren't very happy about that. <laughs> and we every night we come home from the studio and just kind of play stuff there. And I think that's that's like a real big part of writing this. A lot of the songs in the album was just like getting the songs first, but. Well, that's ideal, but it doesn't I'm glad matter. you've said the Motown thing. That's cool. <laughs> it's funny you say that, though, because I think we spent about two days deciding how many kick beats should be in yeah. that drum beat. Oh, yeah. we God, I was very, dying inside. It's Just... a very long process. <laughs> well, I wanted to know, you know, when it comes to, there's so much press, in particular over in the UK and in Ireland. Um, how do you deal with that kind of stuff? You know, once the, the, the albums for... Uh, you know, the band, the shows are for the fan kind, fans kind of thing. But mm -hmm. once the music is out there and there's so much discussion, do you listen to, do you read your reviews? Or is that, do you take that pressure on? Try to read as few bad ones as possible. <laughs> 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 um, I, I think, um, it, uh, I think well, we um, always, exactly. I think we, um, we, we quite enjoy hearing um, people's, 
uh, different perceptions of what they can hear and what they take away from the songs. And a lot of the time, p people will tell us what they think something sounds like that we never thought going into the song writing process it would sound like and so we're all conscious they're like oh that's interesting but we don't go back and listen mm -hmm. to the songs ever again like kind of once it's done it's like okay it's, you know you, you've been too attached to something for so long you know it, it's finally time to let go mm -hmm. really yeah now you're taking it on the road i just want to ask you know how does it feel to play these new tracks live Mayo. yeah it's just nice to have fresh kind of um, ammo, you know, and like I think on the first tour we were doing the same set every night because there's only certain songs that work before or after each other. And it's just nice to be able to switch it up and you know not feel like you're repeating yourself. And mm. In the past, you wrote on tour. I, I read that. I, I don't know if this tour is allowing you to have any of that uh, that time. Do you feel? Do you feel? You know the need to while you're on the road now to write. Mm -hmm. Um, haven't been at all really. Mm -hmm. uh, just been taking it in. I think. Good. I think um, it's just been, I think the reason why the last tour was so hard is because we'd come off and we'd have days off and then those would be taken up by studio days mm. or like having to write. And um, it doesn't feel like we have any of that pressure on this tour. So we're just kind of like pretending we're just like a live band doing covers or something, you know, we just kind <laughs> of, we're kind of just rolling through it and trying to enjoy every moment of it and not stress about anything. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, enjoy your time tonight. We're so happy to, to have you here in Toronto again. And uh, thank you again for taking the time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Pleasure. Cheers.